This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bingo. <laughs> Four o'clock on a Wednesday, you know what that means. Energy. Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And for this show, we're going to talk about transportation and calling it the state of clean transportation. And the centerpiece is the Maui EV Ohana story. And our guest here in the studio is Brennan Morioka. Uh, he is the general manager of electrification of transportation. You can put that to music, Brennan. Yeah, it's a yeah. tongue full. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi. How are you folks? All right. Good to see you, Jay. So nice to have you yeah. here. And we have somebody on the hookup uh, from Maui, which is uh, the center, uh, the Maui EV Ohana story. That's uh, Jarrett Contino, and he's the energy contract manager for Maui Electric. Welcome to the show, Jarrett. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. We have your picture here. We can see you. All right. Okay, I hope it's a good one. Beautiful headshot, Jarrett. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so why don't we start with... Mm, the general uh, status of electrification of, of transportation in Hawaii. Okay, Brent. So I think things are moving and I, and I think starting to get a little bit more aggressive in our schedules and, and our initiatives. You know, as, as we talked before on previous shows, we did file our uh, electrification of transportation roadmap in March of 2018. I can see now say last year. Uh, <clears throat> that kind of outlined a lot of the uh, initiatives and steps that we think are are going to be uh, able to help promote the accelerated adoption of electric vehicles in Hawaii, and it's not just vehicles; it's it's buses, it's uh, transportation equipment at the airports, at the harbors. So it's a much it's a much more comprehensive look about transportation and electrification of that transportation uh, sector in general. And so we've been working over the last um, half e half a year on putting together some of the initial steps. One of the first things that we said we were going to do was file a application for an electric bus tariff to help all of our transit agencies uh, and bus service uh, providers with an opportunity to help introduce electric buses into their fleets. We've also updated our roadmap. The roadmap initially uh, had an analysis on what a forecast would look like for Oahu as well as cost benefits um, in, in terms of the, what EV adoption and increase of EVs on our roads would do for mm. both our economy as well as for our customers, our utility customers. Um, we needed to continue that by doing the analysis for both Maui Island and Hawaii Island. So December was a very busy month for us as a utility because we did file that amendment um, with the additional analysis uh, for both Maui Island and Hawaii Island. Uh, and it continues to show that there are benefits uh, for both our e general economy as well as for all of our customers as we transition towards a more clean uh, transportation sector with increased EVs on our roads. Mm -hmm. uh, then we followed that up with uh, also in the last week or two with an application to the PUC for an electric bus tariff, uh, which I mentioned and we can talk a little bit about it more later on. But we also, uh, one of our, our key initiatives that we filed an application for, uh, which is why Jarris on the phone, was Maui Electric filed an application to transition ownership and management of uh, charging assets on Maui that was previously uh, operated by, or currently operated by uh, Maui Economic Development and, uh, uh, and, and then previous to that, Hitachi as a That's part right. of a Japanese government in, uh, program that NATO mm -hmm. uh, funded uh, in, in order to increase uh, EV adoption or to, to see what char providing charging uh, to the general public would do towards uh, in promoting EV adoption on Maui, which, which I thought was a very fantastic idea and the results were very, very positive in showing that Maui was one of the most progressive and most um, accelerated areas in the country in terms of EV adoption per primarily, capita. Per capita, primarily because of the fact that we had a very robust uh, fast charging network yeah. uh, on that island. It's all about fast charging, isn't it? Let me unpack some of what you unpack some of what you said. Um, so on the bus tariff, electrification of buses. Now the buses are operated by the city mostly, huh? Um, so how does the utility get involved? What, 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 what would a tariff like that say and do? So part of our the electric bus tariff uh, is meant to number one incentivize uh, either transit agencies, so all of the counties um, or state government. Airports has 
quite a bit of, of fleets of buses and shuttles that we're trying to electrify as well. Uh, but there's also a large um, private sector, you know, Roberts Hawaii, Ground Transportation, um, all these different very large bus service providers, Inoa, JTB, um, who provide bus services uh, for our tourism economy, for our, our school districts, for some of the private schools have, uh, have bus, bus fleets. So uh, by offering an electric bus tariff, uh, that helps to uh, promote uh, electric bus integration into their fleets uh, by, by giving them a little bit more favorable rates uh, while they do this transition, um, as well as shifting towards a time of use rates so that the, uh, and on most of the utilities rates are shifting towards time of use, trying to promote daytime uh, loads that's rather than... That's the modern approach for sure. Exactly, because yeah. that's, where, that's where all of our solar energy is, is during the sure. middle of the day. And so we want to encourage people to you know, instead of charging or using electricity during the peak hours, having that, that same load being transferred to the middle of the day, then we can pair that up with solar generation and, and power generation where it's, it's a lot cheaper and we can then integrate this a little bit uh, better for our customers. Uh, so we've introduced as a part of our e-bus tariff time of use, favorable time of use rates where we're encouraging them to either charge the buses during the middle of the day or charge them overnight and stay out of the, the, the peak periods. And, and I think so far they've been very receptive to, to what we've been proposing. Uh, and the PUC? Uh, well, all of our customers, the transit agencies. So we just filed it with the PUC, and so uh, they have, I, I believe, a, a few months to review and, and comment and then provide feedback to us, and then uh, hopefully they find favor in our application mm -hmm. and then and approve it so that we can then offer it to our customers. Sure, the better, really. So, yeah. you know, what now what do you say to the guy who says, well, that's nice that you're electrifying all the vehicles, but if you're still using electricity that's generated out of fossil fuel, how does that really benefit us on the, on the way to 100% renewables? Right, and, you know, and that's one of the arguments um, about electrification of transportation is that, yeah, you might be converting the fuel from gasoline to electricity, but that electricity is still uh, generated by dirty fuel. Which is, which is true today, but at, because the electric companies are all required to achieve 100% RPS by 2045, as we move towards that goal, which is a mandate, so we are required to do it, as we get closer and closer to 2045, that, that fuel energy that is powering electric vehicles becomes cleaner and cleaner every day. Same can't be said for gasoline cars. That, the emissions will continue to be emitted by gasoline-powered uh, cars, versus electric cars, which that fuel and that fuel source will become far cleaner over time. Mm. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good point. Because when you buy a car, a fossil fuel car, which most people in Hawaii are still doing, eh? right. um, then that, that's got a useful life of five or 10 years, and that person is locked into a fossil fuel car for that period of time or longer. Uh, Average person in Hawaii keeps their car for about 15 years. 15 years, yeah. so that was worse yet. I know. So we've got to get them out of the fossil fuel cars, and we can we can fix the electrification of the source uh, all along the way. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Especially with fleets. I mean, over the time, because especially if you have a large fleet, it ta it's going to take you some time to transition, sure. you know, hundreds if not a thousands of vehicles. And so we, we do need to start today if we want to achieve certain goals by 2045. Okay, and further unpacking, I want to talk about the Maui deal. Um, and Jarrett, uh, can you tell us what happened with Maui? Can you give us a little background and how it happened and what happened and where it's going, so to speak? Sure, yeah. Um, so um, Brennan did give a, a brief history of uh, how the JumpSmart Maui um, project came to be. Um, so what actually happened is uh, we had a similar situation about two years ago where um, Hitachi was um, expressing that um, they may be moving on. Um, they came to an agreement with MEDB, uh, Maui Economic Development Board, to continue uh, operating the JumpSmart Maui project for a period of two years. Um, we uh, at Maui Electric have had a, a very close working relationship with MEDB for some time, so um, we were assisting in kind of a, uh, a consultation type, uh, consultation type uh, role with them. Um, we found out um, earlier uh, in the year, or last year, I should say now, that um, Hitachi was intending to um, exit the uh, DC fast charging market here on Maui 
um, when their contract ended in at the end of March. Um, so we were approached by uh, some of the uh, community members here, um, that being you know the County of Maui, um, MEDB, um, and some others to say, hey, look, why doesn't Maui Electric uh, leverage their their expertise um, and um, you know look into taking over this DC fast charging network? Um, so um, in its current form, known as EV Ohana. Um, we are, uh, you know, we were willing to do what we could to continue that pro the project and the program going. Um, we realize how important it is to electric vehicle owners here on Maui. Um, so we, we started looking into it. Um, we, we started first to see um, kind of who was available, who might help MEDB take this over. And um, in the end, everything kind of pointed to Maui Electric as the, the lasting solution. Um, you know, we are here, we've been here for, um, you know, however long at this point, uh, longer than, than I've been alive, certainly. Um, and, um, you know, we will be here for years to come. So it, it really, you know, made sense that um, Maui Electric um, being, you know, the energy provider for Maui County um, and the island of Maui, you know, we take over um, parts of this EV Ohana program. So um, as we started digging into it, um, we started identifying, you know, crucial sites um, that would form a, a backbone of um, DC fast charging across the island. Um, the, the existing EV Ohana program does get some really terrific use from the EV drivers uh, that are here on island, um, but it was designed for the Asian car market. Um, so what that means is the current DC fast chargers here on Maui only have a Chatamo charging port. Um, so in our analysis and, and looking to see what we could do to help out, uh, we identified that, you know, to truly promote the, the electrification of transportation, um, if we were going to step in, we were also going to look to make some changes, and we were going to look to uh, change out the charging technology to open it up to everyone with an electric vehicle. Oh, good idea, um, sure. So, uh, so as it stands, I think uh, EV Ohana has about 44 charging ports on the island. Um, Maui Electric has uh, looked into what the backbone would be to continue DC fast charging from Lahaina all the way to Haiku, um, and we are looking at replacing, um, we are looking at uh, assuming ownership of eight of the current 13 sites, um, which is roughly 26 of the current DC fast chargers. Um, and what we'll basically be doing is over a period of the next uh, 18 to 24 months, We'll be working to um, change out the DC fast chargers to have the newer technology, like I mentioned, um, at those eight sites and provide at least two DC fast chargers um, at all sites. So we'll have a total of 16 charging ports um, that can all uh, simultaneously charge an electric vehicle, um, and that way ensure that we can uh, continue to provide DC fast charging services for the current EV owners and uh, try to encourage you know some of those North American brand EVs, um, any of those uh, residents who buy one of those cars to um, you know start charging here on the island, whereas before they would have only been restricted to charging at home. So uh, that was a, a big thing for us, which kind of brings us to the um, filing of the application, really. So um, end of December, we filed an application with the PUC identifying our plan, and that uh, brings us to where we are now. So let me ask a couple of questions about that. So <clears throat> what, what, what kinds of locations do these involve? I mean, I take it this is a is a purchase of the assets of the EV Ohana by Maui Electric. So at the end of the day, Maui Electric will own the charging stations that were originally installed and developed. So we're, we're not really purchasing um, any of the assets as much as we are just taking over the responsibility for the sites that we've agreed to take over. So Jared mentioned that we're we're looking at eight out of the 13 sites that are currently out there. Yeah. Uh, and we really did an analysis based on what locations were had high utilization, so very You're high not demand. Them all. No, we're not taking them all. Um, because we also need to be responsible and, and responsive to our rate payers. Uh, because if we are going to be recovering costs for uh, changing out the you infrastructure. Want the high traffic ones. We we want to make sure that um, that we number one we're able to recover our costs but also that we're not going to be um, be introducing new costs to other rate payers uh, who aren't you know taking advantage of these of these sites. So the county of Maui winds up holding the assets. 
No, so so who, each who of the owns, different so so we will we will ultimately own the charging units mm -hmm. uh, once we go through the process of replacing them. Currently, MEDB is the the official owner of these current look uh, current assets. Mm -hmm. uh, as we replace them slowly over the course of the next two years, like Jared had mentioned, we will then take ownership of those units uh, because, like you said, right now. All of the units are, are primarily for their, their Chatamo ports, which means that they are almost restricted to just Nissan Leafs because it was based on an Asian market type pilot pro program. Uh, but all of, the re all of the units that Hawaiian Electric companies, all three of our different companies install, we want to make sure that it's available to all the different types of EVs out there. So we install both, uh, we install units that have both Chatamo, Chatamo ports and CCS ports. So whether you own a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Bolt uh, or you know one of the uh, uh, even a Tesla, you can you can get an adapter. Which covers the whole. The yeah. Whole so so there are opportunities for us to increase accessibility to a wider demographic of EV owner mm. uh, through this process. But uh, we are we are trying to be as diligent as we can in terms of identifying strategic locations, both for utilization, so high high um, demand. Um, by people, whether they live in condo units because they can't charge at home, uh, or whether it's an issue of range, right? So we want to be able to put one, have keep the one out in Lahaina because someone in Kahului or Wailuku driving out to Lahaina might have some level of range anxiety. Even though today's cars are far better in terms of range, right? The new Nissan, the 2018 Nissan Leaf has a 150 mile range. So driving from Wailuku to Lahaina is not a problem, and and coming back, you're going to have a lot of mileage left That's on your vehicle. That's where it's going. Tesla yeah, has over exactly, 300. Yeah. Exactly. And so does uh, the, the, the Chevy Bolt has about 250 mile range. Yeah. And the new Nissan Leaf, the 2019, will have about 220 miles. Yeah. So range really isn't an issue, but people still have that anxiety. And so putting these, these charging locations in very strategic places, so pe people still have that, that same mentality that there's a gas station right around the corner. So until I feel that as, as comfortable with a gas car, knowing I have a gas station right around the corner, you know, I want to be able to know that if I just so happen to forget to charge my car last night and I have an emergency trip out to Lahaina, I want to know that, that there's a charger out there that just in case. So where, so where are these stations located? What is the station, so to speak? Is it in a gas station? Is it freestanding? Is it in a shopping center parking lot? Where, where might I find one of these stations that's being acquired? Norm, normally we want to find, because fast charging is, even though it's, we call it fast charging, it still takes a little bit of time. How, still, how long does it take? To, to charge a Nissan Leaf, it may be uh, from an empty battery to full, maybe about 30 to 45 minutes. A Tesla might take uh, a little over an hour, hour 15 or so. Uh, so you still need to have some le level of dedicated time to just sit and dwell, which is why we look for areas um, that have that kind of other opportunities for people to do something else like shop or grab a cup of coffee and they can do other things while they wait for their car to be charged. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have a lot of retail locations, um, business locations uh, that, we, that we typically focus on. We are, you mentioned gas stations. We are we we have been in a lot of conversations with a lot of the the petroleum companies and their locations, and so we've been working very closely with them to see what kind of opportunities uh, as electric vehicles come on online. Maybe there's different opportunities for them to look at different uh, business models as well. Uh, Brandon Morioka, he's the general manager of the electrification of transportation at Hawaiian Electric, uh, and uh, on the phone from uh, Maui, uh, Jared Contino, he's the energy con uh, contract manager of Maui Electric. So uh, we're going to take a short break, you guys. We'll come back and we'll talk about more incentives. You know, what other kinds of incentives can we use um, to, to change out the whole system to electric cars? We'll be right back and you'll, you'll wish you stayed. Yeah. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hey, aloha. Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, 
Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Okay, in case you're wondering, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Runs at 4 o'clock every Wednesday. And we have today special guest, Brendan Morioka, general manager of the um, electrification of transportation at Hawaiian Electric. And on the phone from Maui, Jarrett Contino, uh, the uh, energy contract manager of Maui Electric. So I wanted to ask, in, in terms of incentive, you know, Tim, it seems to me that if there is um, a charging station, maybe the ones that you know, you're, going, you're in the process of acquiring in Maui, two blocks away, and I don't know it, that's a problem. If I really want to feel comfortable, I would be able to find that place uh, on my phone right. or something and, uh, and go there, and even if I didn't actually know it was there. Yeah, I mean, so trying to get as much information out there as possible is, is another aspect of the, our electrification or transportation program, get, educating the public, giving them as much information as they need to make certain choices. And knowing where some of these public chargers are, are available is, is one of the very important pieces of information for a driver to have. I mean, you, you, right now, today, you can't just drive around the corner and expect that there's a gas station, um, you know, like you do with a gas station. Uh, so you kind of need to make sure you're planning your travels out and, and identifying where you need to go for a public charger. So Hawaiian Electric um, has, we, we launched a Hawaiian Electric mobile app about a year ago. Uh, and, and more recently, we have since added our EV charger maps, our DC fast charger uh, locations on a very interactive map on that same app. So if you, if you download the app to your, your smartphone, it's just the Hawaiian Electric mobile app. Uh, you can go and find where the closest DC fast charger is that Hawaiian Electric uh, maintains and operates. But there's other there's other apps out there as well. Plug Share has a has a very good app, and then this, and the State Department of of, of State Department of Ener Economic Development and Business and Tourism uh, Energy Office they've developed their own app as well that people can download, uh, and and it shows where all not just the the fast chargers but all the publicly available level two chargers are as well. And some of them are, are so advanced, too, that it also tells you what the rates for each of the different chargers you would pay if you're going to be charging at that, at that specific one. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you about rates. You know, so if the electrified buses can get a special rate to incentivize that, and that's, that's a really necessary incentive because they are expensive buggers. Those double, right. double section buses, oh, they're really expensive. Um, but what, what about, um, you know, uh, preferential rates or attractive rates or, in, you know, incentive rates, uh, say for Maui, uh, on all these charging stations you're, you're developing. Uh, uh, what is it going to cost me? Are they all the same? You, you mentioned, Brennan, they're all different, or some of them are different. Uh, how do you establish that? Is it the matter of, uh, well, how do you establish that? Yeah. Well, yeah, so, and every private um, provider of, of EV charging has their own different business model. Um, a company like uh, Volta, offers charging for free because they the make their centers, yeah. yeah because they make their monies off of advertising. Are they still a force in the marketplace? Uh, they have a they have a presence. Um they 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 have a lot larger presence on the mainland. I heard. Uh, but they are they are they have an established presence here. Uh, it, our market is still a very early fledgling market with in terms of EVs even though we are second in the country in terms of EVs per capita. Mm the volume is still small. So for private sector businesses to make a business case for uh, large capital investments in Hawaii, it's still very difficult, which is why the utility can play this role during this gap period while the market is, is building itself up. So am I going to see so, competitive signs like I do at the gas station? You know, $4 today, uh, $3 tomorrow, whatever it is. Am I going to see competitive signs about what's going to take me to charge my car? Well, so our... You probably won't see the same thing as gas stations because um, gasoline prices fluctuate so rapidly and so often just because uh, the price of, of oil changes. Uh, it's a very volatile mar market. Whereas the utilities, um, uh, utility rates or electric rates are much more stable. Yes. I mean, we have to get them approved by the PUC. If we want to change them, we have to go into the PUC for application. So, uh, so our rates remain much more consistent and constant over a longer period of time. Um, but with that said, you know, we are looking, much like we offered to the, for the electric bus um, tariff in trying to incentivize uh, the conversion of electric uh, vehicles within to their fleet, 
we want to we are going to be looking at um, preferential or specialized rates for EV owners with some of the public charging and maybe even charging at home. We, we need to kind of go through a process to, to uh, m develop different business cases to see what works, what is, what is good for the EV customers, but what is also good for all of our customers because we, don't want, we cannot uh, have too much preference for one small sector of, of our customer market. Yeah, so sure. It's, it's, it's a very delicate balance. If I'm paying balance. one rate for my home and another rate, and the guy down the block who has an EV that I don't have is playing a preferential rate, I, I might not like that. Right. Um, but what, what about Maui? Is there any talk about this, Jared, about uh, what, what rates are going to apply in the Maui uh, circuit? That's the wrong so, word, uh, the circuit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so with regards to um, EV Ohana or just in general? No, I mean, what, say, let me ask you this. What, what kinds of rates has the EV Ohana been using and how will that change, if at all, uh, under the plan? Sure. So, so how EV Ohana works at the moment is it's a uh, monthly membership where you essentially choose a tier of number of charging sessions you plan to have in the month. Um, from say uh, 20 charging sessions at the highest tier down to no charging sessions but paying a monthly fee to have access if you need it and then paying $5 per session. Um, so that really depends on you know, the, the, the model of electric vehicle you have. Uh, if you have charging at home and you just want to have the DC fast chargers available to you, et cetera. Uh, what you will see here on Maui, um, if the PUC approves our uh, application to take over the eight charging sites, we will use. To, we will move to a uh, time of use uh, rate. Oh, as Brennan was saying, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. a m so, much better so. incentive. It's much better for both sides of the equation. As a matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. You basically pay that's for great, what yeah. you what you use. Well, well, will it cost me less? I mean, can uh, as an EV owner, will it cost me less under the new system? Do you think? So actually, I so the rates that depends the, on how much you charge. Yeah. So I mean, so actually, the rates that we um, are authorized to to offer at our our uh, fast chargers, uh, which is a part of another pilot that the PUC had approved, um, they are slightly they are higher than what you would pay at your home if you were to charge at home. So, so um, theoretically, charging at home is still your your best option if you're just looking for the cheapest uh, charge. Well, that's fair because uh, for a, a charging station, you have to make a capital investment. Correct. At home, you don't. And you're paying for the convenience, I mean, for, just it's for the convenience, convenience of access right. away from your home. Right. And so, so there, yeah. So, so we're we're number one, trying to recover our costs uh, for the expenses that we put in to upgrade the infrastructure and put in the charging units. Uh, but you you also pay for the convenience of having that charger away from your home. Will Will you have control? Will the utility have um, you know, Maui and also here in a similar deal here? Would you have control over the ultimate rates to the consumer, or, or is, that, um, is that something that an individual operator um, of, of the charging station uh, right. facility has control? So no, so, so the rates that we are able to charge at these fast chargers are, di are dictated by the PUC. We, we will put in an application for those rates, and then they will either approve or deny um, what those rates so are. So ultimately, it's going to be statewide the same. Uh, no, each each of our different service design. territories have different rates. So Oahu has one set of rates that Hiko was able to get approved. I see. Okay. Uh, Maui Island has certain rates that just Nico, the way it has yes. different rates now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But the the island wide though. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. So are there any other incentives? I mean, we're down to the last few minutes of the show. Are there any other incentives that that come out of this? Uh, you know, because you know, right now you can say we have high per capita, but we still only have. What six seven thousand cars? Uh, There's about eight thousand. Eight thousand. We we right. had a big big growth. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a big growth this year. No, I mean so there are there are other kinds of incentives that that we believe um, need to be at least discussed in terms of getting through this this early phase, right? I mean we're still very much early in, in this whole development and getting people used to uh, that that initial cost of buying an EV, the the charging infrastructure that people have to install. Um, so, so we have been having some discussions, and and I and I think you'll see some of it um, come up in the in the next legislative session about um, what other kinds of so number one continuing the current incentives or current benefits like use of the HOV lane um, if you have an EV 
uh, parking, free parking benefits at, mm -hmm. at public parking, at least for whatever short period of time, like a me uh, free parking at a meter. Um, right now, you can park at the airports mm -hmm. um, up to a month for free. Mm -hmm. DOT is looking to, to request to change that or at least put a cap on that, um, which, which is understandable. Uh, but there are, are other types of ways that we can incentivize EV adoption. How about the parking lot requirement that there's a ratio of... Uh uh, st uh, parking stalls dedicated to electric cars and all. Right. So, is, is so that that's going to that, No, I don't think it's going to be changing. But, but there, there are many, many locations that are non-compliant, and part of the part of the issue is the cost of it, mm -hmm. uh, which is why the utility, Hawaiian Electric, Maui Electric, Hawaiian Electric, like we're going to be looking probably at the end of 2019, maybe early 2020, in, in filing an application of what's called a Make Ready program, where the utility actually has the ability to recover our costs for assisting, uh, and, uh, assisting site hosts with paying for some of that initial upfront infrastructure cost. Mm. Makes it kind of takes some of the barriers away. Um, we, we provide the infrastructure up to a stub out and then the, the site host comes and puts the charger on. So they still manage and, and maintain the, the charging system, but we help get them ov overcome some of the initial barriers of primarily capital cost of capital for installing infrastructure. Well, why is the utility interested in doing this? I mean, in the case, for example, the Maui deal, um, why would the utility do this? You, you could have let it let it hang with someone else, um, but instead you became proactive about it, or at least when it was proposed to you, you said, yes, we'll do this, and we'll go to the trouble of, of, sure. of having it happen. It, um, it, how does it benefit you, and, and why do you advocate for it? A, a number of reasons. I mean, for the, for the utility, we believe that increased EV adoption, and especially if we can get people to smart charge during the middle of the day, will help the integration of re clean renewable energy. So it can help us get to that 100% RPS uh, mandate by 2045. Mm. So from a selfish standpoint, it helps us achieve that goal. But from a bigger perspective, looking at trying to be a, a partner and, and a member of the, the, the greater state um, community, Electrification of transportation is just good for the state. Increasing EV adoption reduces the amount of carbon emissions in the air. Uh, that's because you have less um, fuel consumption. Less fuel consumption means we have greater energy security within our state. We can keep more of our, our money in our own economy rather than being one of our greatest exports. Well, we send billions out of yeah. the state for, for pet petroleum. Yeah. So, there, so there's, there's very, uh, there's, there's, interest by the utility in EOT, but then there's also a greater interest in the state mm -hmm. in EOT. So we just want to be a part of that solution. And we want to be proactive. We, we, we know that the growth of electric um, cars on our roads or electric equipment uh, in, in our economy is going to be rapidly increasing. And we want to be ahead of the game so that we can provide the electricity for our, our mm -hmm. customers when they need it, where they need it, rather than trying to play catch up and be reactive to that market. I know tax credits are always somewhat sensitive in the square building, um, but I wonder if there's a chance we'll have a, a resumption of the tax credit for electric cars we used to have. I, I think you will. Pro you you may see some discussion. Um, I'm not sure how far that would go, but uh, there are because electric vehicles are are often thought of as toys for the rich, which is far from the truth. Um, uh, they are becoming far more affordable, and especially when you look at a family trying to afford uh, their, their overall energy wallet, owning an electric vehicle helps you save money as a family because you save less on, uh, on maintenance of that vehicle, and paying for the fuel for the car is far less. So uh, there are, there are very, very large financial incentives for any family to own an electric vehicle, but um, there are also ways to limit or cap or, or control how you offer a tax credit or tax rebate, so that maybe you, you, you uh, so that it's it's not just on the more luxurious type EVs that mm. we can we can focus some yeah. of this on the low to moderate income. Yeah, that's a really um, good. Th that's a good thought. I, yeah. I, I, I think that's a great yeah. thought. It would be nice to have them um, resumed, especially given the fact that the uh, the federal credit is what uh, declining now. Well, it, it'll sunset in a, in a few years, but there is a cap on. Uh, manufacturers up to 250,000 electric and vehicles. they're reaching that cap. And many of them, so um, uh, Tesla is, is, has either exceeded that number or is very close to it. Uh, so that tax credit will start to diminish over time. Uh, GM is, is nearing that number with, the, with their volts and the bolts. 
Uh, and also Nissan is probably another year away with their Leafs uh, to hitting the 250000 mark. So at some point over the next year or two, you're going to start seeing these federal tax credits start to either go away or diminish. Yeah, so, but the point is we have to keep incentivizing people because if, if we incentivize them, this is going to happen a lot faster. That's just Correct. human nature. Absolutely. So in, in Maui, Jared, uh, you know, the things that are happening in Maui, uh, what things that are happening in Maui could, would teach us here in Oahu <laughs> How to do this? Uh, is, what, what would you What would you like to show Brennan that he can copy <laughs> here in Oahu? <laughs> well, I'm not sure there's much that I could show Brennan um, that he wouldn't already know. Um, but in terms of you know exciting things that we're doing here, you know each company does have a, a workplace charging pilot, but uh, we have taken it a step further here. We've we've installed some some level two chargers here at Maui Electric which are um, limited when the employees can actually use them. Uh, they're for employees only, but it is actually trying to coincide with the solar peak because we have an abundance of uh, solar electricity, as we all well know. So we are trying to really uh, kind of harness that energy uh, to use as much as we can during the daytime. Uh, and I think once we can get this up and running and, and show that, you know, we could have a demonstrable impact, then, you know, Brendan might think that we know what we're talking about over here. One other thing I, I wanted to ask you. So, Hitachi, um, the, the the arrangement, you know, that that created uh, EV Ohana is is ending. Um, why? I mean, wh why do they want out? Uh, what what does this tell us about the Hitachi presence? I know they were doing a lot of energy things in Maui not too long ago. What does it tell us about their analysis of Maui as a, a laboratory and a market? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that it says too much about um, Hitachi in terms of not wanting to have a presence uh, in the industry. Uh, I think it's more that Hitachi chose to refocus and, and redirect where they were actually looking to have their, their business. They're focusing, from what I understand, a lot more on um, at-home uh, customer mm. solutions. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So what didn't really align with their objectives then was continuing with DC fast charging. Um, they, they haven't made too many uh, improvements or upgrades to their charging stations here because it really fits the purpose of what they were trying to accomplish. Um, they, we, a lot of, we have to give a lot of credit to Hitachi. They really did wonders for Maui in terms of uh, getting that infrastructure installed, really encouraging um, EV adoption here and really getting a lot of people to consider it as an option. But I think they're just their, their business focus has uh, changed direction here. So. We can, we can thank them, um, and then hopefully we can take advantage of the opportunity and uh, improve on what they've already done and just continue to move forward. Yeah, it's our game. It's our game. Yeah. So well, we only have a minute left, Brennan. Uh, could, could you uh, tell the people what you'd like to leave with them about this subject? Well, I mean, you know, I, the, the utility Hawaiian Electric companies, all three of our companies across our three service territories, we just want to make sure that our customers know that we are here as a resource. We want to be that go-to entity where if you have questions about electric vehicles, uh, about the vehicles themselves, about charging, you know, we, we have resources on, our, on all of our web pages to help people go through, educate themselves about um, the different charging types, the different vehicles. We have an EV Watt tool plan that is on our web page that people can do a comparison without wow. the pressure of a salesperson interesting. telling them that's, they should buy this or buy that. That's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, so you can compare what a vehicle might cost compared to a gasoline car, and it even shows you what your savings would be, um, you know, compared to what you would be paying for a gas car versus an electric car, uh, depending on how much, how many miles you drive, what your average um, electric bill is. And so we have a lot of information out there. They can also call us directly. Um, we, 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 are, we take a lot of informational calls or questions. Uh, so we just want to be there to help all of our customers, regardless if they're uh, a commercial customer or a residential customer. You know, we want to be there as a trusted advisor for them. Yeah, I want to be clear about one thing. Uh, Brennan is, is a, a sincerely, authentically nice guy. I say that in every show because it, it occurs to me again and again what a nice guy Brennan is. Thanks for coming oh, down, thanks, Brennan. Thanks, Jay. We always appreciate it. And I'm sure you're a nice guy too, Jared. Thanks for Jared's coming down. Jared's a very nice yeah. guy. <laughs> Thank you both thanks for participating. Much. Appreciate it. Aloha. Happy Thank New you. Year. Same to you. Happy New Year, Jared. Thanks, Jared.